So my name is uh, Dave De Meijer. I'm working on the 3D and Docs project already for a long time. And as this session is about um, architecture, which is mostly a, a slightly slower moving vehicle, I wouldn't say an oil tanker, but we're not a sailing boat either that turns with the wind. So there are things here that reminded me the preparation of this session of some history. So a good number of years ago, I did a, a similar presentation on the design choices that we made or were about to make back, back then and um, what their effect would be on the product. So yeah, that was uh, something I presented on user day. It still had a 4-3 aspect ratio in slides. But um, let's continue here. So I will mostly focus on the 3D and Docs content manager uh, side. So touch points with content delivery. Um, so the, the DXD stack that we share with 3D and sites. Client tools will also come in, uh, in the picture. Mostly I will talk about three big topics and I will highlight a bit the history, where we are now, what is next, and then what it would enable us in the future. And as always, uh, yeah, this is just a look into the future, um, some, point of the some point on the horizon that we are walking into. So technology-wise, I think the, the content manager uses this kind of uh, middleware. I think for uh, the very beginning, it was heavily relying on Complus technology. Uh, so Complus server and library applications moving into the Microsoft.NET world and our .NET core, and that uh, eventually leads us to .NET. So if we think a bit about the history, then, yeah, I think over the past years, we already had many uh, examples of where we're moving from Complus technology into the .NET framework technology stack. Examples, usually we try to migrate in a vertical way, so functional migration and not horizontal layers that we try to rewrite, like first the data layer and then business logic and then API here and there. But it was more vertical that we applied to and it also made it very visible for you guys over time. So we had, for example, when we introduced uh, API 2.5 functions that would allow uh, iWrite plugins. In the past, you had to develop your extensions, your event-driven systems based on a complex based technology, which was called iOnDoc Store, so on document store. Um, that was a big deal with a lot of changes performance-wise and predictability-wise. Um, in the very early days, there was also Microsoft Message Queue. We changed that into background task, which is more geared to the things we need to do, which, which can handle messages that only take a second apiece, but it can also handle publish operations of 24 hours and more in a stable, repeatable way. Over time, we also revisited the translation management um, that enabled the boost in performance and then also uh, integrations like translation organizer allows towards the world server, TMS, etc. So, and I think the last very visible piece was how we rewrote uh, export for publication. So the publish system um, that became uh, a lot smarter, a lot more data savvy. Um, so exporting using the three hierarchies, so from maps to submaps, and not uh, exporting superfluous information onto the file system, which again makes it a lot faster. So we tackled vertical migration um, in that way, and we always kept in mind that the performance had to be the same or better than was definitely there. So if we consider where we are now, then I think we still are in a state that we have two database layers. So there is one layer in the Complus technology and the other one is in .NET framework. Um, so that is a, yeah, a double-edged sword for us because we have to maintain it when we go to the next version of Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server. We have to yeah, do double, double checks. Um, Things that have changed is when, regarding Complus, we dropped some of the managed C++ runtime requirements. Our dependency to MSDTC um, has been removed, which technically comes down that we actually stripped all of the write operation from Complus. So our Complus layer is only about uh, read-only operations. 
And yeah, Compost itself was known in the past as DLL hell. And even in .NET framework, we started with the global assembly cache, but we actually are already out of there. There is only one uh, interop assembly remaining, and that's just to make the Compost pieces work. Um, so that's there. Now, the biggest visible piece for you guys, um, where this Compost vertical stack and, and data layer is still visible, that is in our web client. So the content manager um, browser-based uh, repository view. And yeah, that is heavy on classic ASP and evolving there, although we did it over time, happens, but it's, um, it's becoming very difficult and yeah, we need a, a bigger breaking change. So um, in the evolution, you saw pieces appear like the, the user, user group settings, output format, translation jobs, they're all entities which are in more contemporary technology, but still, yeah, look and feel wise, we, we couldn't let you see that there were two technologies or so meant a lot of alignment and, um, and it still feels a bit uh, older. So yeah, we're already working on a new thing called organized space. So that also means that the entire framework that how it looks like changes and we're using a more contemporary technology and I'll come back to that later. So things that will happen, of course, when we go from at the top web client to at the bottom organized spaces that we'll have to revisit the classics like the repository view, inbox, reporting, search, and condition management. Um, but we'll also try to change uh, that uh, iteratively and we'll focus first on administrators and translation coordinators as personas and make sure that uh, you always have a user interface where you can still do what you need to do. Um, so mm. that's the movement. Mm. Um, so in, in all of this, in, the, in this world, what we see coming next is of course that the .NET framework is becoming .NET Core. And, and that is a, a timeline which I would like to share with you guys as well, because Technically, Microsoft actually set .NET Framework 4.8, so typically the one that comes with a Windows operating system, is the last full version of that framework. And Microsoft is, um, is, is moving into .NET Core, which is their next generation thing. And in .NET Core, they have different support policies. Um, so they have like fast iteration where they show off the new stuff and they have a long-term service release where they are, where they, where, which is the one we would like to align to. So um, on .NET Framework 4.8, that is also relevant because that is actually the maximum version for PowerShell 5.1. So anything which has to do with PowerShell 6 or 7, um, that's all relying on .NET Core. And .NET Core doesn't have the whole uh, feature parity with .NET Framework 4.8. And the main reason is that, yeah, Microsoft .NET Core is, is going cross-platform. So they would like to ship some of the, the Windows uh, uh, specific packages like registry keys, or you can name a, lot, a couple of them. Um, another one is, for example, uh, WS Trust as a communication protocol or um, is, is not in there yet. So, as some generic knowledge for, for most of you, um, .NET Core 3.1 is the long-term service release, which is out right now. Um, there will not be any .NET Core 4, because that is just confusing regarding naming, and uh, that will be skipped. And .NET 5 is there, actually, um, and it's a short-term service release, so just showing off the new features. And then, uh, late next year, Microsoft will release .NET 6. And that is again on long-term service release and the natural successor of .NET Core 3.1. And that was, that is probably our target that we want to align to. So all of these investments from Microsoft to go cross-platform and the new tooling support are also very important for the people using it. Uh, we are using it, uh, professional services, partners, customers, they're all uh, affected by going into the new technology as well. Similar to my example earlier of Complus, uh, I on dock store into .NET 
my right plugins. So if we do all of this, then we have a couple of uh, enablers. Then. And the first one is that if you write plugins right now, we would advise you to write them in .NET standard. And .NET standard is kind of a, a contract um, set by Microsoft. Um, anything written in that, in that uh, uh, contract can be run on the .NET framework or on the .NET Core runtime. So any changes uh, for the future will be small. So keep that in mind. Um, and yeah, we have to move in technology. That is a, a natural evolution because any, any new people that are graduating, well, they're graduating in the latest and greatest and not, and not necessarily in the older technologies like classic ASP. So that's, that's good for us, but that's also good for you. Um, and yeah, Microsoft is really investing there um, and any benefits that they do like performance improvements or better patterns and more uh, security out of the box. Yeah, we'll, we'll all inherit that and move forward. Um, if we really strip the complex data layer from it, because everything on our end becomes .NET Framework and in turn .NET Core, then we actually have one data layer and that would also allow some database model refactoring so that we can optimize our database. But in the current changes, we, are, we always have to do it in two data layers, which is a bit more um, expensive. So aside from back then, um, when we introduced our uh, WCF, so Windows Communication Foundation Services, um, that was the replacement for ASMX, which was also so based and it was then that we introduced claims-based authentication. So a little bit of history on, on the API versioning. Um, the API versioning is mostly about business logic. Um, so how does the business layer interact and, and what kind of answers can you expect? So as a, the very old change was from API 1.0 into 2.0. The change was very little. It was when the product started to support branching for content objects. So you could have a branch of your library topic or something like that. And then every version no longer was a, an integer or something like that, but became a string that we could parse. And we also had uh, matching filter keywords on it so that you can find the latest version on the 3.1 branch. So that was the biggest change. Another change we did in 2.0 and towards 2.5, and it was deliberate to not have a, a 3.0 there, but more like a, an enhancement on the two series, is that we went from Complus to .NET. So that's where a lot of our vertical migration happened. And we highly put uh, functional backward compatibility in mind. Of course, you had to adapt your code to from class 2.0 to class 2.5, but it was all very minimal. Um, and that's, yeah, that made it relatively easy and there were a lot of gains for you because I think the right operations became a factor five or eight faster. Um, our API is also used by ourselves. So that means, and that I'm referring to the public API, everything you see in our client tools, so publication manager and authoring bridge, but also translation organizer, issue remote, it all relies on the public API. So any change we come up with, we actually are affected just like you guys are. If we change something, we really want to make it better. That's the... So because we are affected, we also have the, the same pains and that's, we, we try to even document that ourselves. So this is an extract from the public documentation where we per release of the product still track what is the compatibility expectations of the functions that we have available? So we state if they are supported, um, we state if they are deprecated, and then if they are superseded, then we give the alternative. So which one should you use instead? So we already put you in the, in the right direction. Um, and yeah, some of these were changes to, to get rid of, of some of the technologies like uh, 
NSDTC, so that we only had read-only operation in, in COM Plus. Those were actually drivers that also affect our API service. What you can still see at the bottom of the screen is that we have uh, still a couple of API 2.0 remaining as in supported, supported in their workflow. I think uh, a lot of you know it better as inboxes. So this is our public documentation. And then if we put that in a picture over time, then actually we have all classes migrated. They're all green. The two remainings at this moment in time are inboxes and, re and reports, and then condition management, um, and more specifically, the, the synchronized component, which is an edge case. So um, we would really like to get to full stack .NET framework. So our client tools, like Publication Manager, they're already .NET framework all the way. If they talk to the backend, they're .NET framework all the way, except those two uh, numbered red boxes. And those are the ones we would like to, to challenge next and move forward with. Um, so a change that happened a bit as well. Well, it, when I state the API here, I'm always referring to API compatibility from business logic perspective because even that API 2.5 assembly underneath ASMX SOAP or WCF SOAP is used in, in process um, plugins. That's the business logic, but there are antennas on top of that. And I think there are two important antennas. One is the communication protocol, like WS SOAP and ASMX SOAP. And there is also the security, because ASMX uses a very old built-in user management system and WCF SOAP relies fully on WS Trust. So it actually tried to push the authentication towards the system, which is much better suited than a CMS to do that. So when we look into the future, we want to change that communication protocol to open API, or some of you also know it as Swagger or Swagger UI, um, but that's where we're heading. So we're stepping away from SOAP and we're stepping into open API world which is very well known, it's RESTful APIs. So our main format for metadata and the likes will go to JSON instead of uh, XML, of course, topics and libraries and whatever, they're still in Oasis data XML format, but uh, the API language will be more JSON oriented. Um, it's a, a specification which is well known for its interoperability so it's easier to generate clients from it in all kinds of languages. Um, it's also very friendly for web development. So that's our successor of the web clients or organized space definitely relies on that. Um, we'll switch it a bit towards more resource oriented um, URLs respecting uh, the HTTP verbs. And then where we can, we will also add the uh, HTOs um, so giving you more options like, or already heads up, like what can the user do with this object? What kind of actions are available to him? Um, documentation will also move into the Swagger UI. So it will disappear a bit from our regular documentation set. Um, and we will still respect a lot of the business logic that we have. So requested metadata, required current state, um, that kind of concepts will will inherit and continue with because yeah we're using that API ourselves so even for us it would mean a lot of effort if we change the paradigm too much um, all of this is is hosted by .NET core so if we look at the picture on the right then the gray piece so the business layer core configuration is not very affected by this this is still the same even the API 2.5 assembly layer, so the one you would use in plugins, not very affected. Um, the ones which are affected is that we will add an API 3.0. Um, so we'll introduce a bit more models and step away from the XML containers that you had to throw around, like each object and each fields. Um, and it's on top of that API 3.0 layer that we will 
open up with uh, uh, using open API as a communication layer. Left and right, you see that we have WCF and ASMX web services. Those guys are, are likely to disappear. And on the left, we have uh, something called Web, web API or, or XAPI. Um, that's actually our private web API, and it's the it are the endpoints that support some pieces in the web clients, but mostly draft space, review space are uh, supported by those endpoints. So if we, if we have that, we would like to get that all together packaged up and, and we are considering really one open API project where we will still make a distinction between something we would call API 3.0, so really the V3 version, the public version, the one that replaces the public API that you currently know of. Um, and then we will also merge in the web API XAPI piece. It will get the same uh, quality labels and all that. The only thing that, with, well, what that will happen with the V0 is that we will uh, have the right to change it for a product version, actually. So there are no guarantees that it will work the same across the product versions. Um, but quality-wise, it's the same. With the V3, we do give some guarantees. And that already happened in the past, as you could see from the documentation table, that we're not uh, changing that every release. So it is, this is quite a big effort to get this all together. Um, we have a bunch of API calls, internal and external, that we need to revisit. And yeah, we are affected uh, everywhere where we are using a WCF SOAP. We have to change it ourselves. So we really try to make the, the gap as small as possible, but still also make it a very nice API for future uh, onboarding customers. And as the antenna of the communication protocol is changing, yeah, so can the security protocol. So I'll come back to that later. Um, what this enables, if we are more in, in .NET all the way, we dropped COM plus, then we really get 64-bit mode all the way for all services and also the future cost of ownership. It puts a, it puts, um, a possibility um, on our backlog to step away from Windows as an operating system for the web application servers. It will allow moving away from more costly uh, database providers or to more cloud-optimized database providers. There is no decision there yet, but it's definitely a direction that we and a lot of other uh, software companies are taking. So the security piece. Um, many years ago, this was a slide I used, and hopefully some of you still remember it, but it was kind of the, the easiest way to explain what claims-based authentication was about and, and how to explain the trust, the trust level that comes with that token. And that token here is, is your driver's license or your passport. Um, so that was the explanation back then. We were engaging there to step into a new world. It was still quite volatile, a lot of movement standards from uh, Shipwallet and Microsoft Card Space and OpenID Connect was already showing its head. Uh, you had SAML, you had WS Trust, WS Federation, and we aligned with the, the Microsoft choice and we picked uh, a standard which was also backed by IBM and Oasis, and it called WS Federation and WS Trust. That's the one that was supported since version 10. Um, but hey, time moves on, and there are some challenges that uh, this standard can no longer uh, comply with. And so we have to revisit that, and we'll move into the OpenID Connect realm. Um, and there is an aligned decision with Trillion sites. So this will enable higher security demands like two-factor authentication or whatever your external secure token service comes up with. Um, a challenge we still have on our table is that uh, we have a, a built-in secure token service, so ish STS, um, which is used um, in the cloud or for smaller standalone setups ranging from demos, demo machines, and, and, and more. Um, but it also means in HSTS that the CMS is the identity provider. 
which is not necessarily our core strength. I mean, we are not the ones doing the nicest things regarding password complexity or reporting or things like that. So we're very basic. And that's why um, a lot of you already went to more, uh, well, to systems that are actually built for that, like Microsoft ADFS or Ping Identity, Ping Federate. Um, but in any architectural setup, um, we, we implemented WS Federation and WS Trust completely on the inside and on the outside. So translation organizer as a backend service respects WS Trust and respects your authentication uh, system. Um, and each STS is just a, a simple replacement of an ADFS system, for example. So it was all there, all aligned to the same standards. Um, so we're aligning this with, uh, with 3D Insights um, in a component called Access Management, which behind the scenes is based on Identity Server. Um, so we're, we're growing and, and confluencing together there. Um, now the Identity Server v4 compared to ISH STS, which was based on Identity Server version 2, they dropped WS Trust support. So that's again a sign. Actually, they didn't really drop it. It was actually because Identity Server v4 was built on .NET Core, and .NET Core didn't support WS Trust. So in the end, they dropped it. So another sign that if we want to move into the next generation of middleware, that we also have to do something about the security um, or the authentication uh, uh, challenges. So the security protocol is really changing to OpenID Connect, and we're using the access management component, which is a, a federation gateway. So that means from the inside, the whole system of, of 3D and Docs will respect that federation gateway based on the OpenID Connect protocols. So that goes for the backend services, that goes for uh, the client tools like Publication Manager or the Authoring Bridge or Content Importer, um, just like we did the last uh, eight years with WS Federation and WS Trust. So that will all be rewired. That's a change we need to do. But because access management is a, a federation gateway, you could federate um, to another SDS system, your own SDS system, the, thing, the system you like, or well, in theory, multiple systems you like. Um, so that's, that's uh, how the architecture will look like. So we still need an answer um, for us, what it means as if the CMS is an identity provider, how, we'll, how we will work on that. Um, but the user profiles in the CMS, they should no longer have the password there. That is not, that is not a, a piece where we should focus on. So what does that mean if we move from one security protocol into the next? Yeah, we need to configure a lot of our web services to OpenID. Connect, so that goes for draft space and review space, that goes for the web client, um, organized space. So the web services, of course, need to change. That's where open uh, that's where uh, open API comes in as well. And yeah, our client tools need to change. So in the pictures on the right, you saw that our client tools were, because of the WS Trust standards, they were aware what kind of security was going on. So they actually offered a username password box or a, uh, a Windows uh, authentication box because they would already know what's happening, which is not ready for multi-factor authentication. So we'll probably change something browser-like. So the picture at the bottom, an example from Visual Studio who already does that, they show you a browser control. And if that browser control goes to your organization and challenges you with a a token or whatever, that's up to your organization. We just need to know who who are you when you come back to our system. And that's where we, we will assign the necessary authorization for you. Um, we also need to do something for things without the user interface. So services like translation organizer, background task, even the PowerShell library is remote or content importer which has the two modes because content importer can run with a user interface, but it also can run in a more batch mode. So we need, we need some answers there. We need some, 
some work to be done. And to make all of this happen, of course, you need all of the installations, upgrades, configurations, that all needs to match up, which is the work that we're working on. So yeah, functions and architectural changes come together and we try to always make sure that architectural things really show you value on the functional end as well. So the technology and platform are big drivers here. Um, so that's something I shared, Complus over .NET Framework into .NET Core. Um, the one data layer will definitely unblock us for some, some wanted changes. Um, the easier deployment, because yeah, we're really retreating from Complus, we're retreating from Global Assembly Cache. So that means that we are a lot more ex copy minded and that has a lot of advantages also in updating and hot fixing. Security is a primary citizen um, that goes for static, static analysis, but also for penetration testing. And then, yeah, stepping into the next generation of security protocols here as well is high on our radar. Um, yeah, we need to um, give people that work with our technology the necessary tooling and, and have, make sure that they can use the, the more contemporary tools on how to develop and how to debug. So that's all of stuff that matters for us as well. And yeah, user experience eh? with, with everything we do has an experience and that can be UI, but it can also be a lot better performance or a lot more predictable. That's also part of the experience. And uh, if we're revisiting web client into organized space, then yeah, localization is also there. So it's not only about uh, one language anymore. So to kind of do all of these changes, we have two possibilities. We can have a very backward compatible product um, where, it is, where we'll probably do only one release with some overlap from the two systems. And then I'm referring to mostly WCF, WCF SOAP API with the older security protocols um, side by side with the newer ones. But it has a whole ripple effect if we need to support the two of them side by side, because also then publication manager needs to know both of them, your installation, if you're running then customer support needs to know. So there's a lot of duplication going on. And um, we really are, are thinking that we should go for a, a big bang. Because in the end, you will have a des dev and test phase. Um, it happened before, and, and we think it's worth it because you'll have to do it at some point. And if you really get value from it, like improved performance, then you better get it early than, than late and then have to shelve it for a while. So, um, And any investment that we don't have to do in a, some backward compatibility pack will just mean that we can go full steam ahead with with new features based on this uh, revisited architecture. So those are some thoughts for the future. Um, so what is in our pipeline? Organized space, that's that's the, a big visible piece. So replacing the web client um, built on, definitely in the beginning, a private open API, but when we are ready for that, big change, we will open it up to become web services version 3.0. So it's open API with modern authentication and all of our tooling, yeah, again, we are affected. All of our tooling will have to be rewired that they know how to work with that. Um, and this all in the, the new .NET uh, ecosystem. So that's the bridge we are crossing at the very moment. And, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, being present in this session.